Welcome to Stall Side Podcast. Uh, how goes it today? Today is is great. We're uh, n- n- new group of foals coming, so everything is happy now. Yeah, that's right. Um, the time is certainly ticking away. And because of that, we have our friend and colleague, Dr. Laurie Metcalf, coming to talk to us about the new foal exam. Dr. Metcalf has made her career out of, of uh, taking care of these little guys, and she is an example of, of how to do a really good job with it. And she, she does a, a fabulous job with her exams, taking care of her foals. And so, um, you know, we, we've got a lot to learn from her. Yeah, she's um, out there on the coalface, and it's been really good for us in the hospital to have somebody out there that's sort of owned that um, initial foal uh, exam. And also, she's a great drafting gate for what needs to stay on the farm and what needs to come in. And yep. that really helps us here in the hospital. And it's great to be able to turn these foals back to her care, knowing that if there's any issues, she'll get hold of us. She can recognize problems when they happen. And um, our instructions will be followed to, to the T. And she keeps smiling the whole time. Yeah, she's, oh, doing she's, got, she's got a great attitude. She's a great teacher. She's very, very smart, very compassionate. So I'm looking forward to our day with her. Yeah. Oh, well, excellent. So um, that's uh, coming up soon. Uh, Dr. Laurie Metcalf talking about the new foal exam. See you then. Dr. Metcalf, welcome to Stallside. Well, thank you for having me. I'm yeah, Laurie, thanks for being with us. Here. So, Laurie, tell us a bit about mm-hmm. yourself. Uh, well, I am originally from Wisconsin, which you will catch in my accent every once in a while. And I, uh, I went to undergrad there, and and just couldn't really figure out what I wanted to do with my life with my animal science degree. So I moved to Kentucky in 1997 and started working at a, um, a thoroughbred farm. And I absolutely loved it. Loved the industry, had been a fan my whole life. Um, so it's kind of a dream come true for me. But as I worked there, I sort of decided that I was more uh, uh, sort of interested in the veterinary aspect of everything. And so I got a job at the one and only Rudin Riddle Equine Hospital in 1998 as a technician. And uh, I worked in ICU and surgery uh, for three years and then decided I probably needed to go back to vet school. So uh, with the help of a lot of um, people like Rolf Embertson and Dr. Hopper wrote me a recommendation, uh, Dr. Bramlage wrote me a recommendation, I got into school back in Wisconsin. And uh, so I went back home for four years, but I continued to work at Rudin Riddle for my summers and kind of just kept that connection there. And then eventually did an internship uh, in 2004, 2005 in the hospital. And then I'm a glutton for punishment. So I did a ambulatory internship <laughs> as well under the esteemed, um, Dr. Scott Pierce in, uh, 2005, 2006. And then I eventually stayed on after that. So, and I had actually taken a job. This is a very interesting story. I taken a job with somebody else and, uh, I hope Dr. Riddle's not listening to this, but um, Dr. Pierce kind of pulled me aside and said, hey, have you signed a contract yet? And I, I said, no, there was a storm or something that prevented me from meeting this guy to sign the contract. He said, well, don't sign anything because and you need to act surprised. But Dr. P- uh, Dr. Riddle is going to ask you um, tomorrow if you want a job, but you have to act surprised. I said, okay, I'll <laughs> act surprised. So the rest is history, and I have um, been here ever since. So. Actually, Tom is the one guy that listens to every episode. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. The part of keeping a secret is keeping it a secret. That's right. <laughs> but yeah, so revealing it on a podcast is probably not the, uh, probably yeah. not the way probably to keep it a secret. Not, if, it, if anybody's wanting life skills, these are not them. It, it was one of my better, um, better uh, life decisions, that's for sure. So Excellent. How was your acting job when you, when you found out? <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. I mean, he never said anything to me about it. So, uh, so yeah, I think I pulled it off. Not until tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After this right. episode plays. That's right. <laughs> so, no, it's, it's been great for us, too, having you here. You've been an incredible addition to the to our veterinary team here. So, I thrilled you're here. That. Yeah, for us in the hospital, it's great to have you out there in the field um, dealing with things at the coalface, so to speak. So tell us, um, for the benefit of the audience, um, how do you have that conversation with the client uh, when they um, have a new foal? Or what conversation do you have with them before they have that foal to set them up for success? They, well, I, th- I think it's important. A lot of people, you know, the vast majority of these foals are, are fine without veterinary intervention, but there's so many things that we can catch early um, that uh, that are important that are may not be obvious right away, and I, I tell people um, that foals are just not 
they're definitely not little horses. You know, uh, if you, they, they have subtle changes can turn into big problems really, really rapidly. And so uh, if you can find some of these things early, the prognosis is much, much better than, um, than it may be if you let it go too long. And, and I joke with people, but it's kind of not a joke that if you give a foal a chance to die, they, they will um, take advantage of that every single time. So you just have to be really diligent with foals. They're not as hardy as adult horses, and you just have to really be on top of them. So the most important thing is to have a veterinarian check your new, newborn foal within, you know, the first 24 hours um, of its life. And, uh, and like I said, the vast majority of them are going to do great. But, um, but it's important to find those problems early so you can um, do something about them and, and give that foal the best chance that they have uh, at life, that's for sure. So, Walk us through your new foal exam. Okay. Um, so, so what I do usually, um, I, I like to sort of just assess the situation before I even go in the stall. A lot of foals, you know, they're not obviously not used to being handled. Um, and so I'll just... Um, kind of give it an overall assessment before I even walk in the um, in the stall, and so um, you know, it, does the foal recognize the the mare? Um, is it nursing? You know, um, what I like to see before I even get in there is is just the foal mm -hmm. nursing, happy, um, just um, everybody's calm, pleasant. Mm -hmm. Um, the whole deal. And so something like, like this foal is nursing in this picture um, here. What I don't like to see is um, if I walk in the stall and the mayor's spraying milk. So um, th this is a, a problem. Unless the foal is only an hour or so old, uh, I, I, I have a, um, a real problem if I walk in the stall and I see milk on the mare's teats. These foals should be hungry. They should have learned how to, to nurse by now. It's probably going to be about, like I said, the majority of my, you know, your foal is born overnight. Majority of my new foal exams are between eight and 18 hours, um, something like that. You know, you'd like to have them over eight hours old before you pull the blood work, um, but it doesn't always work out, you know, whenever you're going to be at the farm, but you just try to try to get that pretty close. And so, um, so hopefully that's my first time seeing the foal. Now, as horse owners, they need to know, um, sometimes you can't wait that long. So we kind of have a rule, the foal should stand within an hour, um, it should nurse within two hours, and it should pass its meconium within three hours or so. Um, that usually happens actually pretty rapidly. So I'm dating your rate. If your foal has not nursed in four hours, I, I consider that sort of a veterinary emergency. And you need to have a veterinarian out and make sure that foal gets um, it colostrum, whether tubed or um, the, the foal just needs a boost of some sort so it can get itself rolling. These foals don't have glycogen reserves like adult horses do in their liver in order and can't go long periods of time without getting some sort of nourishment. So, um, so, so we'd like to get um, some colostrum into the, those foals right away. And, um, and a lot of times that's just the boost that they need to get them rolling. So, uh, so at any rate, they, uh, they really need to uh, call us um, you know, before the new foal exam, if they're having a problem and, and horse owners need to know, um, you know, what those things are that they're supposed to look for. And those are some of the things. Can you repeat can. those numbers again? So, so st standing within an hour. Yep. Uh, and nursing within two, you know, and I could go a little bit, like I said, you probably don't have to call. I tell people four hours at the very, very latest, but I like to see them in a normal fall. I like to see them nursing by two hours. And then the meconium, honestly, people give enemas so quickly, they usually pass the meconium, you know, within the first hour. But if they haven't passed it within three hours, you need to call, um, you need to call a veterinarian as well, because they may have some congenital abnormality or, you know, they just need to get things moving a little bit. And your veterinarian can help you do that. That's I, for sure. I think those are great points that you actually make. Like you learn a lot by standing back, looking at the foal and looking at the mare, because, they should be taking care of business. Yep. And if the foal is not associating with the mare, if the mare is streaming milk, that foal should be on that mare sucking that milk down like nobody's yep. business because they're hungry little things. Yep. And that's hugely good advice to sort of say, stand back and see, is the appropriate uh, behavior being seen between the mare and the foal? And has the foal hit all of those landmarks that you, you talk yep. about? So once you actually go past that, stand back and have a look and ask those questions from the history, whether those goalposts has been hit, once you get into that stall and get your hands on the foal, what's your process? What are you looking for? And what do those things mean? 
Okay. So what I like to do is do my new full exams uh, systematically. So it may just look like we're in there, boom, 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 quick exam, but there's actually um, a lot of very important things that we're looking for. And, and, and we do a lot of them. So it may look like you know, we do it fast and easy, but there's really a lot that goes into a new fall exam. I, I always tell interns it's one of the most underrated um, exams that you will do, but one of the most important ones as well. And so I go into um, I go into the stall and I um, I put my stethoscope on the pole. A lot of times that you know they're, they're a little bit worked up, so I just give them a chance to kind of settle down there a little bit. Here's me um, listening to a foal's heart. Um, and uh, I just give them a chance to kind of settle down a little bit. And so there's a lot of things, just even listening to the heart, you um, you are, are listening to, you know, foals normally have a normal murmur, and I'll hear that on the left side. It's it's called a PDA murmur. Some of you guys may be, uh, you know, familiar with that, but it's where the foals don't, re they don't need to use their, they don't need a lot of blood flow through their lungs in utero. And so there's a hole that goes from the aorta to the pulmonary artery that they um, that is, is open in utero, but closes as, you know, they uh, force air through their lungs. And sometimes it just doesn't close right away. But that's a normal murmur. But um, sometimes you have loud murmurs. And if they're on the, the right side, I'm listening for things like ventricular septal defects and things like that, that, um, that you're going to need to follow along. And some of these things will resolve in the next few days, but I need to identify them on day one so I can follow them and they don't get sort of lost in the shuffle. So um, so those are some of the things. When you listen to their lungs, they should be clear. You know, full lungs are very loud, but um, but they should be clear. You shouldn't have any milk coming out of their nose. You shouldn't hear any milk in the trachea. These guys are real quick to get an aspiration pneumonia if they're not suckling properly um, and have a weak pharynx or anything like that. So these are all things. It looks like I'm just taking seconds to do this, but these are all things that are going through my head and that I'm looking for while I'm doing it. So um, so those are all just really important things. The other, one of the other things I do is I do look at the mucous membranes um, as well. Um, there's two um, mucous membranes that I um, I am really looking for in uh, in foals. This is a foal with very pale mucous membranes. I would assume that this foal is probably bleeding somewhere. Um, and and the other thing I wanted to bring up too quick. Um, and this picture is a good example um, because it horrifies me. This person's handling this bowl with no gloves on. I can't stress the, and this is not to talk about biosecurity, but I cannot stress the importance of wearing gloves with your newborn foals. You know, just consider yourself a Petri dish um, for these foals who have naive immune systems and it just will... Um, it's really, really important, at least for the few first few days of these foals' lives, to, to wear gloves. I always wear gloves. Sometimes I'm double gloved, you know, and just try to keep these foals as clean as you can. You know, handle the clean foals before the sick foals and things like just common sense. Um, so, so that's just one thing to think about as well. But this foal actually had um, some fractured ribs, which I will go into later. And we actually lost that foal because it had lost so much blood into its um, into its chest. But um, at any rate, that's just something that I'm looking for. And I look, it's two seconds, but, but it's a very, very important two seconds. Um, the other thing you're looking for, you don't want them to be jaundiced. Uh, and this is a picture of some yellow mucous membranes, the other color that I, I don't like when I look at uh, mucous membranes. Uh, this would be from a foal um, suffering from neonatal isoerythralysis, or it's an NI foal, as we kind of say um, in slang. And uh, this condition, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is uh, when a mare uh, produces antibodies against a particular type of red blood cell. And if her foal happens to have those uh, red blood cells and ingests her colostrum where all these antibodies uh, live, uh, the foal essentially um, is destroying its own red blood cells via its immune system. And so uh, that's not very compatible with life for very long. And so we need to identify these foals pretty rapidly so we can get blood transfusions into them and um, and try to help them them out a little bit. So now, um, that's fairly rare, but even with NI screens and all the monitoring that we do, um, we still have a few slip through the tr cracks for whatever reason every um, every year. So it's something that I always, always, always check. And it's something that 
um, people on the farm and owners can can look for uh, as well. That's for sure. But, so. but you made a good point. This is mostly mm-hmm. preventable, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, and, and I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't think it gets done too much outside of this area, pulling those bloods on on mares. But it's it's so quick, so easy, and you yep. can identify these mares, and then you uh, avoid the problem almost all the time. Yeah, and that's right. I think for people that aren't regularly having foals, I mean, you can you can prevent this. You can actually screen yeah. the mare to see if she has antibodies against these particular blood types, and you can stop this happening. And um, nobody wants to see foals have this condition. I mean, nobody wins. No, and it takes a lot to pull them out of this hole. You know, and these guys here um, in our medicine department are fantastic at it. But um, but 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 it's hard. Um, that's for sure. And for something that's completely preventable, it just it seems like um, y- you know a bad deal. So so at any rate. Uh, so then, uh, so then after I kind of look at my cardiovascular and respiratory system, I will listen to their GI tract. Now, foals, they've been nursing for a few hours now, and they're feeling good. When you listen to them, they should have, um, it's called borborygmy, but it's just those, those noises that you can hear, and you can hear it with a stethoscope sometimes, you know, when they're so, um, um, so active. But this is what you want to hear in a newborn foal. If I listen to their GI tract and it's silent, I know it's impending doom. It just means that they have an ileus and things aren't moving um, the way that they they need to, and and it eventually means that that foal is possibly going to um, eventually look like this poor foal on its back here. And so um, sometimes if I listen to them and hear that they're, they're quiet, um, we can sort of investigate it and prevent them from. Um, getting colicky and getting uncomfortable and, and having these issues, um, before it happens. So, um, so at any rate, GI tract, very, very important things that you can, you know, do as owners is obviously, um, watching to make sure that they're nursing and that helps the GI tract. All that claustrum is just full of all kinds of wonderful things, ex- um, besides antibodies, you know, um, I think everybody's familiar with colostrum, but, just to review, if you're not, you know, um, foals, they, they don't get their antibodies and their protection like humans do through the, the placenta. They get all of theirs via passive transfer, which is um, through their colostrum. So, so their mares, and that's why it's so, so important for these foals to get good colostrum is they put all of their um, disease-fighting um, weapons in this colostrum, and if they don't get good quality colostrum, then they um, then it sets them up for disease, um, and which is why we we pull blood work, which I'll talk about later as well for this reason. Um, but uh, at any rate, um, they uh, you um, everybody at home with their own tools can can watch for um, signs of GI uh, distress. If I walk into uh, a new foal exam and I have a um, hind end that looks like this, I am um, very, <laughs> I'm very upset. No foal should have diarrhea on its, uh, its new foal exam. This is sort of a yellow mustardy color. Um, and some of the, uh, I tell people, you know, it's not the funnest thing to talk about, but it's something that they can do to monitor these foals. So, so they go from, you know, the initial meconium, which is sort of, and inevitably, I I don't know why, but, um, and this is horse people in the industry in general, when you're talking about theses, you, um, you have to describe it, you know, as food. So, so the meconium I find, um, kind of looks like little bourbon balls, sort of in you know this chocolate fondue, and this is a good picture of meconium and and what a foal sh- should be passing. You have ruined my so, ideal dessert. I, I know, and and I I'm sorry about that, but uh, <laughs> and then it's as they nurse and get this col- colostrum, sort of changes to sort of a a butterscotch pudding. Um, I, I like the butterscotch pudding. That's what I kind I like to see on my new foal exam. That's what, and, and in fact, sometimes while we're giving plasma, um, this is what you will see. And that, and that tells me that these foals, um, have ingested some good colostrum and, and their, uh, their GI tract is moving as it should. Now, um, when, if it turns to mustard, I mean, any kind of mustard, spicy mustard, regular, you know, 50 cent Kroger mustard, I don't care that mustard is bad. So um, especially if it's mustard liquid consistency, um, the, the diarrhea in a, a neonate um, is not 
a great prognosis without some intervention. So those are things that anybody can notice um, on these foals. So, so that's one of the biggest things that I'm looking for um, when I'm looking at the GI tract. So, uh, so then when I'm kind of done with that, then I will do a little bit of a musculoskeletal um, look here. So this foal, um, actually, somebody had called me about before I uh, um, before the new foal exam. So this foal, um, for those of you who are listening, it has um, it has a severe carpal laxity, meaning it's very very back of the knee, but then it has a severe left hind fetlock contracture, and so we don't really know why these things happen. We kind of hypothesize that it's just a uterine malposition type thing. But this foal um, was so back of the knee, it couldn't get up and nurse itself. So I had come out in the middle of the night and got some fluids and colostrum into it and kind of gotten her strengthened, strengthened up enough to, uh, to, to get rolling. And then Dr. Fleming helped me out with the uh, carbo or the uh, fetlock contracture. And this foal, everybody kind of looks at these foals and they think they're complete train wrecks. But this foal actually won its first out at Churchill Downs by um, lengths and lengths and lengths about uh, three weeks ago. So this, she's a two-year-old right now. So, so it just goes to show you that these foals do fine. You just have to help them out um, for the first... Uh, first few uh, days of their life until they can kind of fend for themselves a little bit. So um, so that's one of the things you kind of try to address. Like I said, people have a little bit of a meltdown about these, but but they all work themselves out, I promise. So, But your veterinarian can definitely help you help them, that's for sure. So um, uh, one of the other things, one of the biggest things, and this is one of the most important parts of our new foal exam, um, are checking for fractured ribs. And so um, I, uh, this is just a really important part of it. You know, if I feel any crepitus swelling, um, it, you know, any suspicion whatsoever, I will, uh, I'll ultrasound these guys. And so here's a picture of me ultrasounding a chest here with my trusty technician, Morgan. Uh, and so th these are really, really easy to ultrasound. You, um, you I just use my rectal probe. Um, that's on my machine all the time, and you just scan. And so what you'll find is, um, here's another picture. So the, uh, the, what I'm looking at here, the, the, in the middle of the screen, there's a bright white line, and it, uh, and it should connect all the way through, but you can see there's one side of it overriding the other one. And so, I, uh, so I'll, I'll know right away. This one's very, very obvious. There are some that are much, much, much more subtle, that you have to watch. But the other um, reason I like to scan these is to make sure they're not bleeding into their chest and there's no fluid around it and things like that. So uh, so it's real easy just to double check yourself. You know, our, your palpation skills get pretty good, but um, for me, the ultrasound really um, just kind of confirms what I'm suspecting all along. So uh, it's important to recognize these because um, the foals need to be on a little bit of restricted exercise. Now, sort of depending on how bad the fractured ribs are or how many are affected, there's a lot of variables that go into it. You know, some of them you don't have to lock up for weeks at a time, but, you know, they can maybe have a, a cage, you know, right outside the barn that's the size of a stall just so they can get a little fresh air, you know, Farm managers don't like to lock the mares up for, you know, their reproductive reasons and things like that. So fractured ribs are always a buzzkill um, on your new foal exam, unfortunately. So so, the, so there are things, you know, I try to work with people, but at the end of the day, you don't want to be responsible for fall, calling this foal okay when and if something happens. So, and it's a real hard call as a veterinarian, especially for me on the farm, to decide which one of these need to be referred to the clinic for surgical repair um, and, and things like that. So, you know, I try to make an informed decision and try to, um, you know, involve my clients in that decision on, on what to do, but, it, but it's hard on these sometimes. But the most important thing is to recognize them, you know, and, and some of these will get missed that are super subtle and all those folds, the majority of those go fine, but I just am more comfortable knowing that they're there so we can work accordingly. So Yeah, I think you make a good point about those mm -hmm. ribs because they're surprisingly common that there are fractures there. Mm -hmm. And they can be very subtle. Sometimes it's just a little step in the cortex of the bone. They don't have yeah. the overriding like you showed in that picture. And, and the thing is, is to tell people, hey, I need to come back and have a look at this. That's There's exactly a little bit right. of pain here when yep. I palpate this. Maybe a little bit of swelling, not seeing anything, but... 
you just sort of say, hey, we need to check this again because you know we find this in the hospital. Foles come in, that doesn't feel quite right. It looks okay. And then mm-hmm. there can be like a green stick fracture, right? right? One cortex, one side of it's broken, the other's not. And then after a couple of days, there's a fold move, it lets go. So yep. it may well be that you have to come back and you know everybody should be okay with that. Yep, yep. And, and I think they have, people have gotten um, good with it you know, um, recently just cause they know how, yeah. how important that is. So, um, so yeah. So, um, next while, while I'm down there, I kind of, um, I palpate the, uh, uh, the umbilicus. Um, and so this is a picture of a very nasty one. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, you try to have everything happen as naturally as possible during birth, but sometimes the mare gets up quickly or, um, or she, uh, or the, it, it just, you have a hematoma form there or, or, or whatever. But when you palpate these, there's going to be a body wall defect there, but you don't want them big and swollen and irritated. Those are the ones that I will come back and check in a few days and make sure that, um, the structures are shrinking down and, and looking like they should. Um, so people, um, who are wondering why we get all worked up about the umbilical structures. So, so when they're in utero, you know, these are the, the vein arteries, uh, and, uh, the urachus, these are all the things that are helping this foal survive, um, within the mare and helping waste products and circulation and things like that. But, um, even when your umbilical cord is cut, these structures are all still associated with the full systemic circulation. So if you get bacteria in there, um, until these um, all these remnants regress, you can um, get things like septic joints and bacteria like to travel to all kinds of places like the lungs and things like that. So it's very, very important to monitor these these structures. And this is very easily done on ultrasound as well, but owners can subjectively look at these um, umbil- umbilicuses, these external umbilical remnants and say, hey, that looks too big, you know? And so that's why I like to get a first kind of feel of it on my new foal exam and we can monitor sort of which way it's going. The, the foals should urinate within the first eight hours of their lives. You know, other things owners can watch for, they shouldn't be posturing to urinate with nothing coming out. Um, they should watch the external urethra. Uh, remnant for um, any uh, urine dripping out of it. Um, like with colts, you know, we tell them to watch for two streams or one. Um, they, they shouldn't have um, urine coming um, out of their, um, of their, their penis as well as the, uh, as your urachus. And so, um, and that happens obviously because that's how full urinates in utero. But once they are born, that should close off. It doesn't close off. Um, it's not, you know, urine is sterile, obviously. And so, so what's the problem there? But all the moisture is a very good environment for bacteria. And we don't want bacteria anywhere in um, the whole urogenital system there. So, so at any rate, just one of the other things that uh, some uh, owners can watch for as far as that goes. While you're down there in these swellings, um, talk to us about hernias. Um, so um, there's different kinds of hernias. There's umbilical hernias. And so all of these folds, because your whole um, uh, vein, artery, urachus remnant is coming through there for, with your umbilical cord, you're going to have a body wall defect there. That should close within the first week or two. Um, so, But sometimes when they don't close all the way, um, we will have to repair them eventually, but I like to give them a few months to do that, obviously. Uh, while you're down there, they can also have inguinal hernias as well. Um, and the and it's fine sometimes if you have a, um, a defect there, but what you worry about is when small, you know, that communicates with their abdomen. Sometimes you can get small intestine sort of escaping down through there, and that's when it becomes sort of a a medical emergency. And so I usually, on my new full exam, I do just palpate up there and, and make sure there's not. Actually, my, um, <laughs> my biggest complaint when I do have um, inguinal hernias is that um, they're, they're, it's a, it'll be a newborn foal and, and someone will call me and say, this foal's testicles are bigger than any foal I've ever <laughs> seen before. And I'll know 
they're probably not testicles. It's mm. probably small intestine. <laughs> so, but it is something, but they were looking and that's the most important thing, you know, and they called me because they said, wow, is this okay? And yeah, no, it wasn't okay. So, so yeah. Uh, so that's kind of what I, um, the only other thing I kind of look for just very subjectively on my new full exam, I look for any signs of sort of prematurity and, and hopefully owners have given me a little bit of um, something to go on as far as, hey, this foal was 10 days early, for your, her last date bread was this, so we're a little bit worried. But, but sometimes if they don't know, they don't know, and, and that's okay. But this poor little foal here has the floppy ears, super fine hair coat, super fine boned, um, and this foal is going to need a little bit more help than some other ones. And one of the biggest reasons that we worry about the premature foals is because they're their bones are not ossified as well as, so the carpal and tarsal bones are the two last sort of places for bones to ossify. And so here's a good picture of um, incomplete ossification of some, some tarsal bones. And so what can happen is because these bones aren't hard, just standing sometimes will crush these bones and, and leave these folds kind of permanently um, affected. You know, they just don't ever come back to completely normal. Now, some of them do, you know, with, with stall rest, but, but you need to know that it's there in order to do something about it. And this is a lot of what we talk about prevention. Ounce of prevention is worth a, a pound of cure, that's for sure. So, so at any rate, we like to know um, what these bones look like. And this is just, I mean, and it's not even a matter of expense. You can do one radiograph of ETOC and, and kind of know what you're dealing with. So, so if I have any suspicions about any prematurity whatsoever, we will take a radiograph of, uh, of ETOC, that's for sure. And that can save a lot of um, uh, distraught owners in their yearling year when you radiograph the hawks and, uh, and see that they've been crushed. So, so that's just one of the, one of the other things that I, uh, that I look for. So. Okay. So you've got your history, talking to the client. You have stood back and had a look at this fall, seeing how it's behaving mm -hmm. in the stall. You've gone into the store, got your hands on, gone through all the things you've just talked mm -hmm. about. What comes next? Uh, then I actually try to usually try to put some blood um, on these foals. I tell people um, I like to pull the blood work when the foal is at least eight hours old, but I really prefer to do it, you know, at least eight hours from when the foal has first nursed, so they have a chance to get that colostrum into their bloodstream, and so you have a more accurate IgG to sort of know where you're, um, where you're standing. So, so when we pull blood on these foals, um, we just kind of have a, a new foal blood, um, uh, panel and it consists of a CBC, um, and an IgG. And on some farms I will do a creatinine as well, just checking their, their kidneys. And you have to be careful not, um, reading too much into the creatinine because a lot of these foals will normally have, until they get hydrated, um, they'll have, normally have a little bit higher creatinine. But, um, you know, like this one is 2.7. I wouldn't worry about that. But if it was 10 or 12, that's one I would definitely uh, recheck and maybe try to hydrate with some fluids a little bit just to protect those kidneys a little bit. And that can sometimes be a sign of um, that they had a problem or an insult in utero and it's just something for us to monitor, but nothing to panic about. Um, uh, we're really looking at uh, the white blood cell count on these foals. Um, for, uh, if it's too low, we kind of worry about sepsis and that we may have to cover these foals with antibiotics. Um, if it's too high, it may indicate that they had something going on in utero already. You know, if the mare had placentitis or something like that and the foal may need further uh, you know, antibiotic courses to try to, to help them out. And, and, you know, we talk a lot about antibiotics and foals and, and, and I, I just, they're not, I always say this, they're not just little horses. You know, we try to be extremely, um, judicious and responsible in our antibiotic usage in adults, you know, getting cultures and things like that and not putting them on antibiotics until we actually really have to, but we have a little bit shorter fuse on foals because if you wait even just a couple hours too long, um, it, you'll get burned. So we tend to put foals on just broad spectrum antibiotic coverage, just not prophylactically, but if we suspect any problem at all, we're quicker to put foals on antibiotics probably than we are 
adults because they just go downhill so fast and they just, they need more help than adult horses too. Would you agree with that? I mean. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to be very proactive with antibacterials because yeah. they don't have, they just don't have the inherent ability to deal with they, an infection without assistance. No. And so shoot first, ask questions later. I mean, yep. they'll see joints, they'll yep. see their absolutely. lungs very quickly. They get bacteremic so easily. You have to be ahead of the game. Yeah. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're looking for, um, with our, with, uh, the white blood cell count there. And I, li I like the whole, you know, if you want to sort of, um, do the minimal, I would say do a white blood cell count in an IgG, but I like the CBC just to make sure that their, P um, pack cell volume and their red cells and everything are, are where they should be, um, as well. So, so the IgG, um, you know, it's a measure of uh, sort of, um, you know, a subjective measure, but but it's close anyway of the quality of colostrum maybe that the foal has gotten, ne not necessarily the quality, but just to make sure that they've gotten enough of pretty good, you know, quality colostrum. You know, you can have a lot of lower quality colostrum or you can have a small amount of awesome colostrum and, and hopefully both of those are enough to get the job done. So we consider failure of passive transfer, meaning they didn't get enough good colostrum, um, less than 400 uh, on our scale. Um, and I think it's grams per Grams milligrams per, per deciliter. Milligrams per deciliter, yes. Um, and that's how we measure in our lab. Other labs can will measure it differently sometimes, but, but that's kind of our scale. And so um, – uh, between four and 800 is partial failure. And then kind of greater than 800 is, is what we, we like to see. But, but honestly, if they've gotten good classroom, most of these are in the thousands and two thousands, if these foals are doing okay. So the IgG can also sort of, unless the mare has been actively dripping milk and you sort of knew you're going to be in trouble. Um, it can be one of your first sort of indicators that there's something not quite right with the full, like maybe they got good quality colostrum, but they didn't absorb it, you know, and that can tell you, so there's something inherently wrong. You might need to do a little bit more investigating on, on what, um, why that fall may not have, have, uh, absorbed what it should be. Um, do, well, do well the other so. thing is, is, is they got it and they consumed it because right. they have that infection right. that is sneaking along beneath the waves. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so that's just a number that we like to, to, and people, some people wait until, you know, after they've gotten plasma and things like that. I typically, if I've had enough time, I kind of like to see what they, what they really, um, have, you know, what the colostrum gave them. So I'll try to pull it before, but it doesn't matter as long as you know that, um, that they, that, that they got, uh, have a Fairly respectable number. Um, you know, we don't we don't worry too much about when it is that you're pulling it. So, uh, you know, if you catch them early enough within the first eight hours, if you're suspicious, um, you know, you can still maybe tube them colostrum. I think I have a picture of somebody tubing colostrum here. Oh yes, um, old Dr. Haywood. We we love Dr. Haywood. Um, and it, these foals are surprisingly tolerant of this. Um, you, we just take a, it's actually an enema tube that we use and, uh, and she's actually tubing plasma here, but, um, but it, it goes down real easy. It's quick and quick and it, um, it works really well, but that's only if their gut has not closed. So when they, uh, to absorb colostrum, their gut has to be, we could call it open, but it's just, these are huge molecules and they have to be able to transfer from the stomach into the bloodstream. But in that same thought, you know, um, all, some of our pathogens are also huge molecules. So they can't, the gut can't stay open forever. So, um, so if they don't get good quality colostrum, what are your options? Um, well, your option is, if it's too late and you can't tube any um, colostrum, uh, you uh, you use plasma. And so I use plasma for a variety of reasons. One one of them is for failure, passive transfer, obviously. But um, another reason is using it um, as a hyper hyper immunized plasma. So for those of you who aren't familiar with this. Um, we do this routinely on a lot of farms and we will, this is, I have no financial affiliation with this company. This is just a company that we've used for um, a long time successfully. And, uh, and so it, you kind of cater it to um, 
the history of the farm and the history of their problems, you know. So all most of the research on hyperimmunized plasma has been done on Rhodococcus equi. And so um, most of these formulations have some Rhodococcus in them because that's the, those are the ones that are backed, you know, research backed. But um, some other people think that um, some of the GI pathogens, um, that it helps those as well, you know, some of your Clostridium, Salmonella. So your farm, you can get whatever formulation you kind of want based on your history of disease on your farm. So, um, and I typically do these plasmas um, on during my that new full exam when you're pulling blood work and, and doing everything. And it sounds like all of this is going to take a really long time. But honestly, like it takes maybe, you know, from the new full exam, pulling blood and giving your plasma, you're maybe there a half an hour. It's just, it's not as much time as it sounds like, that's for sure. So when I'm giving plasma, I um, just pop in a temporary catheter and uh, and I, I suture mine in um, just because my technician is um, always running. Here's my trusty technician. She's just and she always wears gloves, which I love her. And she's just worth her weight in gold because she will um, run these plasmas to these foals. And then I'll go on to the next foal and start my new foal exam and things like that. Um, and she's been trained, you know, it's a biological product. So there's always a chance of anaphylaxis. And so she's checking heart rate and, and watching these foals. And she's done so many of them that she knows what to watch for. You know, if they're going to have a reaction, they're tooling around normal one minute and then they drop to the ground. And so even though that's rare, it's something that she watches for with every single foal that we run plasma to. And so usually um, they're just kind of walking around the stall like this, and she just does a really, really good job. Sometimes she will uh, get lucky, and uh, and they will lay down for her. So here's a picture of one a foal on her lap <laughs> with her smiling and looking really happy about it. Um, but at any rate, um, some people will sedate the foals to do this. Um, I don't like to do that. It's, it's not wrong, but I don't like to do that because when I'm monitoring for a, um, a reaction, you're monitoring heart rate and respiratory rate. And I just feel like if they're sedated, they're not being quite as honest about that. So, um, you know, sometimes you'll have a little Lucifer in a full suit um, that is just being horrible and you don't have a choice and you have to sedate them. But I would say out of three or 400 foals that we gave plasma to last year, we sedated maybe two of them. So um, it's really something that can be done quick and easy and they're not... Um, you know, and then they just go about their business, you know, when you're done. And, and it just, I'm a believer in plasma. Um, you know, it's expensive. There's no doubt about it. But I do feel like it gives some of these foals a, a little bit of a boost, whether it's just a blood volume boost or, or what. It gives some of the foals a boost before you even know that they need it, you know. And that way, you don't have to worry quite as much about the quality of colostrum because, you know, they already, you know, they got some plasma afterwards. And, and even if their IgG comes back not optimal, they already got some plasma. So you check the next day and, and it's probably fine. So um, it's just kind of, like I said, it's an expensive thing, but it's, um, but it's, uh, it's an important thing. And um, it's become more and more routine in, in a lot of my practices or a lot of my farms. Um, so in situations where people want to insure their foal, is there anything different about that exam and what other things would you look for? Um, there's not, I mean, I try to do, regardless of anything, I try to do the same very thorough exam. Um, the only thing, I, I might be a little bit more particular about the timing on things. Um, like if I'm a little bit short on how long the foal's been nursing and I'm concentrating on that, that IgG, I, I may wait um, a little bit longer, or I may come, you know, come back in the afternoon and pull the IgG instead, um, just because the insurance company is going to be looking at that number. But as far as fundamentally insured or uninsured, I try to treat 
the foals all exactly the same. So yeah, it's probably something for the the listeners to realize that that, that eight hundred number is a pretty hard number on that insurance paperwork. That's exactly right. They don't like seven ninety seven. Nope. They want eight hundred. <laughs> they want eight hundred and one. And so that's exactly. You're right. right. The timing of that is important, and yeah, they're a little bit more protective. And and, and two, I disagree with the the insurance company is a little bit of this, and I've sort of voiced my opinion. You know, they're cut off for an acceptable. Uh, white blood cell count is, is 5,000, um, but they don't want anything over 13,000. Well, let me tell you, I will take a newborn foal that's only 12 hours old. I'll take a 13,000 all day long before I take a 5,000 because those foals aren't quite hydrated. And that number's only going down from um, your new foal exam blood work. And so, um, you know, if it's 5,000 today, it might be 3,000 tomorrow. So, um, so, so if I have a 5,000 white blood cell count on my new full, um, blood work, I, I'm not, I'm going back and I'm checking that the next day just to make sure that, uh, that everything is okay. And sometimes it, it does go up, but, but usually it goes down. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, it's just something to kind of keep in the, in the back of your, you got to keep everybody happy, but at the end of the day, you got to do right by the full and you, you do the right thing that for the full, um, before you, try to make the numbers match for the insurance company, you yeah. know. And I think that's a great point to raise too, is that sometimes you just got to come back and have a look. It's not yep. like one and done. That's right. I mean, you're just, you need to see what the trajectory this fold is on. Yeah, because yeah. there's, there's a lot of variability in normal. What, oh, yeah. what, Absolutely. What, what normal is. And, Absolutely. And so, especially when you're dealing with blood work. The only exception I would say is they are all Satan in a full suit. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, they're either yeah. trying to kill themselves or you. Yeah, well, that was a, an outbreak of benevolence from yes. Dr. Metcalf. Yeah, two out of yeah. 400. I mean, I understand that's just your sedation, but they're all evil. Yeah, It's the power of her mind, just <laughs> yeah. willing them to behave themselves. I feel much calmer doing this podcast knowing Laurie's here. <laughs> so um, you've got through that first 24, 48 hours. You've uh, done and dusted on your new foal exam. Everything's pointing in the right direction. Let's just cut it off at, by the end of the first week. What are you telling your clients to look for? in that first week of life that to make sure that foal goes ahead and blossoms? Um, well, the number one thing that they can do in order to ensure the health of their foal is to um, take the the temperature. I know this isn't super easy for a lot of people, especially if you, they're the only person um, working um, with that foal, but taking temperatures is the most inexpensive, um, best diagnostic tool that you have. And uh, just because... A lot of these foals are going to spike pea fevers before you ever know that there's anything wrong with them clinically. And like I, I preach this to everybody, but if you can catch something wrong with these foals early, your prognosis is much, much better than if you're trying to dig yourself out of a hole. So if you uh, if if you find that you know a normal temperature for a foal, I say um, call me if it's anything. But during the first week, they're going to run a little bit higher. So I tell people. You know, if it's over 102.5, call me because that's abnormal. But some of these foals will um, run 102 and be just fine, you know, during the first week. But then after that, they should start to normalize down, you know, between 99 and 101 and change and things like that. You know, our scale, our temperature scale is a little bit different for foals. You know, if we have a, a mare that's 101.7, we're going to worry about that. But these these neonates, uh, that's that completely normal for them. So, so just keep that in the back of your mind as well. But you can be, you know, the first person to know that there's something wrong with that foal when you take its, its temperature. That's for sure. That, so that's, that's the important. one thing that they can do. It, it's a lot of information. Oh, yeah. The, the yeah. again right there and it's, it's free. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yep. For, for me is, is that the foal gains weight. Like we yeah. get them in the hospital here and if you're treating a sick foal and it's gaining weight, you know, you're winning. Yeah. If the foal is losing weight, Regardless of what your paperwork says, regardless of what your clinical yep. impression is, yep. you are losing. And they grow so fast. And you'll see them from day to day and it says, man, this thing is really porked out. Yep. And it's actually rounded out. And so if people are looking at these foals and seeing a steady um, increase in body weight, maybe they snap a picture with their camera mm -hmm. phone and then a couple of days later take another one to say, hey, this foal looks like it's got bigger. That tells me that we're on the right path. Yep. But if somebody sort of says, yeah, this foal's looking a bit hungry, looking a little bit bony, if the mare's not producing milk, well, you have mm -hmm. a you have a reason. The mare's sick. If the mare is producing milk and the foal's losing weight, or as you absolutely very um, intelligently said, if the mare is streaming milk at any point, you've got a problem. That's right. But right. the foal should always be gaining weight. Yep. 
Yep. And, and I tell people just to monitor, when I say monitor nursing, you know, I mean, whether it's, you know, if it's not nursing enough, I want them to notice that. But if this foal, it, a foal should get up and nurse and be satisfied and laid back down and take a nap, you know, until it gets up again, maybe 20, 30 minutes later and wants to do it again. If it lays down for three minutes and gets back up and is looking for milk, that's my first indication that maybe that mayor is not giving that foal what it needs. And maybe, you know, the inherent problem isn't within the foal. It, it may be within the mayor, but those are all things that owners need to be cognizant of um, because there's a lot going into the equation here. You know, the way we talk about it here, everybody's going, it's a miracle if any of these foals ever actually make it to being weaned. But <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's <laughs> but why it's just a lot to, to watch for, you know? Yeah. And that's why Bart's so healthy because that's how he lives his life. <laughs> he goes to sleep, he gets up, that's he right. has a feed, he lies down, goes to yeah. sleep, gets <laughs> up, has a feed. Minutes. Yeah, about yeah. 30 <laughs> 30 minutes. I mean, it's, it's incredible. I mean, that's why he's such like a paragon of a man. That's why he's just, you know, glowing with health yeah. and a great smile. We it's love a, that. It's a privilege to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I think that's absolutely um, a good advice. I mean, you know, if you're going to crystallize it, you just got to keep your keep your um, your eyes and your mind open, yep. and um, just check the boxes. Do your due diligence and involve your veterinarian. Um, foals are fun little creatures, but they're very yep. fragile and they derail quickly, and you have a steaming pile yep. uh, before you know it. So, and, and I always tell people, you know, it's not necessarily. Like, like, just use your powers of observation. It's not, I tell interns this all the time, but it's not um, necessarily because you didn't know, it's because you didn't look. So just know your foals. And I, I tell people this too, you know, handle your foals, know what's normal for them. You know, there's some foals that's completely normal for them to come in and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep and sleep. You know, that's just that foal's personality. It's lazy. But then there's other foals that hardly ever lay down. And if that foal that hardly ever laid, lays down is sleeping all day, you may have a problem, but you need to know the foals and their personalities in order to discern that. So, so like I tell people, just spend time with your foals, and and you'll um, you'll figure it out. So, that's excellent advice. Know who you know. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, excellent. Well, Laurie, okay. this has been great. Thanks for your time and your expertise, and um, we'll all be the better for this. Yeah, I, I agree. Thanks, for, thanks very much for being with us. And if you've ever seen Lori do uh, one thing, she left out. You got to talk to him. Yeah, she <laughs> she talks. She's the full whisperer. The full whisperer. The full whisperer. I, I, I've learned that from Doctor Metcalf. And it's not necessarily what you say; it's how you say. Yeah, it. That. That's right. That isn't that just good rule for living? Yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> the truth. A good rule for living, and you can't tell that with a text or an email, can but, you? No. So no, you no. talk to her foals. She doesn't email her foals, and she does not text no. her foals. <laughs> She talks, she to talks right falls. to him. So, yeah. no, th thank you for for being with us. It's yeah. It's thanks for having me, guys. It was fun. That's great. And that was stall side for this week. We were with Dr. Laurie Metcalf talking about new fold exams. See you next time. 